We'll attempt at reading a few verses. How's that? Hebrews 13. We'll get in there. I'm, I'm trying my best to diligently work through this and get through it. Uh, we're coming, it's interesting how we're just kind of coming to a close in a season of closing all of these different things. John is over with, of course, and then uh, we just finished our evening um, evening series. And um, we'll be cle- closing out Hebrews shortly. And then, I don't know, we'll either go into some doctrinal things uh, for a season here in Sunday school or we will move into another book. I don't know. For whatever reason, this morning, this morning, uh, my mind was kind of on Ezekiel, but I don't know if that's just because I'm reading in it or if because that's where we'll do Sunday school or not. But we'll move into something uh, rather shortly. <clears throat> I've been working pretty diligently. Um, I don't know. We're talking like four and five hours of reading a day on trying to get ready for uh, going through the book of Proverbs in the evenings, and so I'm excited about that, although not so excited because I realize how long that's going to take. Um, just to be honest, like, and so um, I hope that's an encouragement to you. We'll probably do that in both evening services. And I will tell you this, it will be one of the most beneficial things that will ever happen uh, in your life is you'll understand Proverbs. Uh, that's where wisdom comes from and um, just an incredible thing. It's, it, it takes a little bit. I'm, I've been reading a book. Um, you know, I, English is something I enjoy uh, now that I'm an adult, but as a kid, I would torture my mother and not use punctuation on purpose. Just being honest, like I was not a very good son in that matter. Um, but uh, I was good in other areas, but like I purposely left punctuation. On. I mean, I just didn't care. And um, yeah, well, you know, those of you who have children, there's hope for them. They'll grow up and maybe they'll grow out of that nonsense. Um, but nevertheless, I've been reading a book on understanding um, the Bible as literature. And so, under, you know, and I, you know, I harp on this on a regular basis already. Um, there's the he, there's the 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 lit, the Bible's arranged not in chronological order. Obviously, it's not even read, written to us uh, or arranged in a subject matter order per se. Uh, it's arranged in genre more than it is anything else. And so, all of the the Old Testament law is arranged together, G- Genesis through um, Deuteronomy, and then after that you have the history books, and so that gives you the history of the is uh, the kingdom of Israel. And then it moves into the poetry books. And then the poetry books will move into... um, Some people will make a delineation between the poetry books and the wisdom books, but the wisdom books are poetic. And so you can't really do that. They're poetry books. And then it goes into the prophets, which are a completely different genre of uh, biblical literature. And then it moves into the gospels, which are narrative-driven, but they're accounts, they're first-hand eyewitness accounts of Christ and his... Uh, and his work here on earth. And there's four of them for a reason. They delineate Jesus in different ways. They try to tell us who he is uh, and focusing on a particular thing. For instance, we looked at John recently and it portrays Jesus Christ as God. And so that's the reason why it's, um, it starts with in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. It doesn't start with the genealogy because he's always been. Then it moves into the early church history. The book of Acts kind of stands alone with that. And then we move into the epistles. You have several of them. And you'll notice that they're tied together. Uh, um, even, even you have the general epistles, the church epistles, the pastoral epistles, and then um, they're not in that order. But, and then they're actually the church epistles, the pastoral epistles, the general epistles, and then the book of Revelation stands on its own as prophecy in the Old Testament, the New Testament. I don't know if you've ever caught that, but they're arranged that way. And so there's distinct literary forms in each one of those uh, groupings. And so, for instance, when you look at poetry, you need to understand you're reading poetry. Y'all, y'all, y'all following? Um, and so, and that's an important thing. So I've been reading a, quite a bit of, it's, I don't know, this is a hundred and something page book on Hebrew literature and uh, just been super informative. I've encur- I'm encouraged, but we're going to be going through Proverbs soon. I hope that you're excited about it as much as I am. You might not be, just to be honest with you. Because once you find out that uh, what you've been doing is foolish, you might decide, well, I wish I wouldn't have known that because I like doing foolish things. And um, anyways, we're going we're gonna to tr- move right on into Hebrews this morning. So I, I just encourage you, uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I think you should be excited about finding some 
uh, treasures in the scripture. So we looked at one through five last week and we ended with let your conversation be with, oh, I'm four. <clears throat> the marriage is honorable in all things and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And we talked about how that um, the marriage is an incredibly important thing. God says it should be honored above all things. Um, and, and quite frankly, it talks about the physical relationship being a wonderful blessing inside the bounds of marriage. Outside of it is a great curse. Um, and so there, there you have that. And we'll move forward into verse number five. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with, with, with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And, and then verse six goes along with it, even though it's a kind of a separate thought. Uh, but they're, they're, they're not completely separate. And you see that because it says so, so, right? So what does that mean? I said this. So this, right? So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You've got to remember, by the way, as we, as we study this out, I want you to think about some things. We are writing, we don't know who wrote the book. We know God wrote it. We assume, so most of us will assume Paul. Anybody disagree with that? You've, you've done your own research and you say, listen, I think it was somebody else. Okay, all right. How many of you are like, I'm just trusting you because I have no idea? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, church history, and you can look at some of the early church uh, fathers. Um, there, there are these, I mean, I think about, I think the first person describes Paul as the writer of Hebrews is in about 200 AD, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. You can look. Um, not to mention the, the literary form of the book matches his writing, and so you can look at the styles. Um, you can also see at the end where um, he says, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. You know, he's got a deep connection to Timothy here. Seems like a, you know, it just it is very closing and his beginnings seem very Pauline, if you will. And so, um, and there's other clues throughout about the book. The more familiar you get with your scripture and who's writing what and how they write, you more you look at that. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's Paul, but it really doesn't matter if God wanted us to know he would have absolutely made sure it was included into the book. But he says he's, he's writing this. Whoever's writing it is writing it from Rome, or at least from Italy. Um, and so how do you know that? Because he says so. Um, if 20, if look at 24 and 25. Uh, salute all them that have the rule over you and, the, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Or in other words, the, the people here at Italy salute you. Embrace. And by the way, salute means embrace. It literally means hug. Um, it, it could be translated hug very easily. And so it, it means embrace. And, it, and it, inside the word salute means two arms. It, it's a two-arm embrace. That would be the actual literal translation of that Greek word. That's a hug. You, you see where I'm going? And so um, he says salute them that have rule over you. So it's written, written from, from Italy, probably uh, Rome. Um, but nevertheless... He's writing to Hebrews, hence the title of the word. And so it's likely that the, this book was intended to all Jewish believers. It was likely intended predominantly to be um, preached or, or read in and around the area of Jerusalem. Remember, this, has been, this was written before 70 AD. The Jewish people were still inhabiting Israel um, by and large, most of the Jewish believers were still in that region. Uh, there were people who were uh, believers who were Jewish outside of that region, uh, but the predominant, the pre predominant population of Jewish believers were still at least in that region of the world. And so, the writer of Hebrews is writing to explain to them all of the how do they how do you how do you reconcile? He's basically the whole book is reconciling Judaism the Old Testament faith that was given by God and Christianity. And it's easy to reconcile, and Hebrews does a great job of helping us uh, to be able to do that as well. So when we read this, remember that. He's writing to Jewish people, reconciling their, uh, I, won't, I don't even want to say their old faith. It's not their old faith. It's that the, the Jewish nation they frack so modern day Judaism is a splinter off of what God gave in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not trying to 
you have to be careful because there are so many bad doctrines out there. The church did not replace Israel. The church did not and will not replace Israel. And so you have to be careful when you say some things. I just want you to be very abundantly clear of that. In the age of you can get false doctrine all over the YouTubes and the TikToks, um, that you need to know that. The, the church very plainly and clearly in Scripture, yes, you can find a verse here and there that can support anything you want. I mean, you can. If you really want to, if you want to do something, you'd be like, I'm going to find a verse to support that. You can do it. It's not that difficult. However, um, we did not replace Israel. Israel has very specific promises granted to them and them alone. But Judaism, as it is practiced today, is a splinter off of the faith that God gave Abraham, that God gave Adam, that God gave Noah, that God gave David. You with me? What we practice today is what God gave. It's always been about Christ. It's, it's been from the beginning, Genesis 3.15, it's always been about Christ. And when they left Christ, they left the faith. And we maintained, we were grafted into their faith. We, we were grafted in. As Gentiles, we were grafted in. You, you're familiar with the passages, okay? We were grafted in as a wild branch. And so we get in on some of the promises that God provided to Adam and Abraham. Some of them, not all of them, okay? Uh, particularly the Abrahamic covenants. Um, we don't get a land flowing with milk and honey in the Middle East, okay? Like, we didn't get that one. That's not to us. But we were grafted into the spiritual promises of eternal life and remission of sins, a close relationship with God, uh, that we might be able to worship Him, and many other things. And as, the, as we read Hebrews, he's writing to Hebrew people trying to reconcile what they've always believed with what is true. And it was true. The sacrifices were given by God. Uh, the types in the Old Testament were pictures of the future and what God would do. And so what he says here is, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that ye may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. At the writing of Hebrews, persecution has already ramped up greatly. It's not... It's not so high that the Roman government has put their thumb hard and fast down on Christians. They have not begun this yet. They will. It will happen very shortly, particularly around the 70 AD period, and that's where it begins to really explode until about the... Um, uh, somebody help me with the Council of Nicaea. When was that? Three? Three-something? Thirteen? No, no, no. The first one. Long, long time ago. Um, Constantine. Nobody? 313? 313? Is that what you were saying? Oh, you said 13. So I was like, 1300? That was longer, Calvin. <clears throat> so thank you, Calvin. Y'all should know that. That was good. 313, yeah. So that's when it, the, the thumb of Rome began to lift off. And so they, Rome started their persecution from about 70 uh, of the Christians particularly until about 313. Before that, it wasn't necessarily the Romans that were doing it. It was the Jewish people who were causing the problems. And they were, they were, their influence on the civic government of their day is what caused the civic, the civic government could care less about the Christians. They didn't want Jews rioting in the street or causing riots. And the Jews were causing the problems. And so understand the early Christians were really suffering from Jewish persecution. They were using the Romans as the sword, as the implement, the bullies, but it was really Jewish per persecution against the early church. Uh, at least in the, the people who ruled the Jewish system. What would happen is, is um, you know, Marshall would, would come to Christ. He'd be a Jewish man. He'd come to Christ. And then, you know, his, his brother David, you guys are your brothers right now, okay? Uh, his brother David... Would stay, uh, would stay at the temple and, and he'd listen to a high priest and he would, he would understand that, oh no, this is the way we're supposed to do it. And then, um, you know, maybe David, maybe David was the oldest in the family or maybe he's the youngest, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, but uh, their parents are both gone, you know. These brothers are trying to lead their family for the Lord and maybe there's more brothers because they're Jewish. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's, you know, 70 AD, so people had babies. 
And, um, and so, well, I, need another, I don't need another David. I'm sorry, David. Sig is one of their brothers, too. And so David and Sig get together, and they say, listen, this guy has gone. He's a heretic because he left the temple, and he left the faith. And it's such a serious thing that these two would arrange a funeral. And a funeral back then, I mean, it was a public thing. They, carry, they carried a casket through the street and hired people to wail and mourn for days. It was a public event. You can watch it, by the way. Uh, the Arab world still does their funerals like this. They have funeral dirges where they literally parade through the streets. Uh, you've probably seen it on the news when some, like, one, one of these, like, um, terrorist fighters dies and, you know, they're parading through the street. All these men are carrying the bodies and it's like a, almost like a riot mixed with uh, some kind of a mosh pit nonsense and they're just wailing and, and crying and chanting and, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's, that, is an, that is a Middle Eastern funeral. And they would have done that for Marshall, even though he's still alive. I mean, it wasn't just, oh, you're dead to me. Like Sig just said out loud, but not loud enough for y'all to hear. It wasn't just, he's already trying to get rid of you, Marshall. Y'all are not even real brothers. It's ridiculous. Um, it wasn't just, you're dead to me, I'm not going to associate with you. No, 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 no. We're going to go through the whole thing. And by the way, um, Dead men can't buy groceries from me as the grocer. Y'all following? And dead men don't, can't be my tenant. And dead men, I'm not going to help them in time of need. And so when Marshall accepted Christ as a Jewish man, and he went and publicly displayed that through baptism, he became dead to his family. Now, I want you to think about that as we read this passage, okay? Um, <clears throat> let your conversation, your lifestyle, be without covetousness. Well, we, all, we understand what covetousness is. It's the greed, of, it's the love of money, right? Like, just you want more, you want more, you want more. And, and quite frankly, we want more for many good reasons sometimes. Not always altruistic reasons, but sometimes we want more for altruistic reasons. And be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, for that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We, covetousness uh, should be stamped out in our life, because if we are covetous, we will not trust God. Amen. And then when things like this happen, because he's writing to Hebrew people, when things like that happen, um, you're not going to trust God in the situation. You know, if you get fired from work because you won't, you won't, um, you won't bow the knee to Caesar because God said to do something different, you see, if you but if you have that, you have that covetous nature that you need stuff. And, and listen, this is um, this kind of highlights maybe the difference between men and women. Men, uh, uh, men stress about uh, those those kind of things because they want they're they're hardwired to provide for their family. We're hardwired to provide for our family. That's the way God created us, and so we're hardwired for it. And so we stress about providing for our family. Some of you who have transitioned out of the Air Force, I'm trying to look around, Brother Ian's not, oh, they are out of town. Brother Ian uh, just transitioned out of the Air Force, of course, and you know, there's a, there's a bit of stress associated with that. Yeah. He knew it was the right thing to do, and God wanted him to do it, but there was a lot of stress associated with that. Think about Matt, he was transitioning from, when you transition from here to Washington, from Washington, right? Washington? Oregon, whatever. It's all the same. <laughs> Somewhere with trees and stuff. Um, it's green there. I do know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have to paint around here for it to be green. Um, we it it's, it gets green twice a year. Spring and fall. That's it. <clears throat> um, for like three weeks, you get to mow the grass. Um, you know, there's a certain there was a lot of stress associated with that. It was a, that was a stressful couple of years to provide for your family. You know. I'm not trying to call anybody out. I just, we're family, you know. Now, there's a stress associated with that. For David moving here, ah, whatever. Pitch a tent, right? Yeah. No stress associated with that. <laughs> I mean, he didn't have anybody to provide for, though. So it's a less of a stress. I'm not trying to, whatever. Y'all know. It was the same for David and Cindy. They, they were trying to move here for a year and a half or something like that, you know. Um, from about an hour and some change north of here, and, and there was a stress associated with provision, right? On the woman's side of it, there's a stress associated with 
you know, th there's a nesting nature, you know. Is there going to be food tomorrow for my children? Man, even when the kids are gone, by the way, there's a nesting nature in women. Is, is the sec they're, they're hunting security. That's just what, that women are hardwired to that because they have a nesting nature. God put in their heart to, re you know, to, have, to build homes. Um, and so when you build a home, that's why we call it a nesting nature. You know, you're, you're trying to make sure your nest is okay and it's well stocked. And that's in, that's in the nature of God put inside of us. So there's a certain amount of stress associated with covetousness. Um, it, we, we, we can cross the line from being naturally desirous to provide. And, and remember, who's he writing to? And what's the circumstances of their getting this letter? He's saying, listen, avoid covetousness. Why are they covetousness? Because they want a new... Uh, you know, a, a new brand new truck. No, this is this is first century Middle East. Okay, you are lucky to have a like a donkey. It's not it's not like you know. There is no one in here that would not be upper class citizen. We would be the top one percent of wealthy people in this time period. That's how you live. You are. It doesn't matter how much you make in here. Okay, you live in the top one percent of society in the Middle East in this period. How many of you plan to eat more than one meal today? All right. How many of you plan to eat a meal with meat in it today? You understand that that is that that was for kings. I mean, I don't, we don't really think about it, but that was for kings for two thousand years. Not for peasants, or or even middle class people. Middle class people ate bread and grains. I mean, it was beans and rice, if you will. Middle class people ate beans and rice. They had one. They had maybe a second pair of clothes, and they had a one a one room house. Um, I don't know if you if you understand. So Jewish homes. I just you got to think this way, okay? Jewish homes would often have like a. Um, you remember in the 1970s houses, they got like an elevated portion, okay? I don't know why they did that. I don't know if it was a, like a style or something, but um, you ever go into like an old 1970s house and, and you, you walk into a main level and then everything else kind of just bumps up, you know? And uh, I, don't, I think they just want you to buy another home when you get old and you trip. I don't know. Maybe it was a marketing ploy. Uh, but that's kind of how their homes were. They had a higher spot, and that's where they would eat and cook uh, and do those kind of things. And, and they would move all that away. I would sleep there at night. Um, heat rises, by the way. I mean, there's a reason for this. And then, um, and then they would bring their animals in. Many times in the, in, at night, you'd bring your animals in, and they would sleep in the lower section, dirt floors. And so you slept with your sheep or your cow or your donkey in your house. Y'all sign you up for that? Okay. This is middle class. This is middle class Israel. This is their house. Um, and, and so, when you when you tell these people don't be without covetousness, no, they're not trying to get the new iPhone. <laughs> you understand that, right? Yeah. They're trying to have more food than just today's food. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. Most of the people in the world did not know where their next meal is coming from. They grind it out every single day to eat at night. And likely they would only have had bread in a, in a, in a, like a satchel bag that was made early in the morning by uh, the woman of the house or the women of the house. They would make some bread uh, on an open fire. And uh, we're talking like a lightly raised... Um, almost like a pita style bread and they would have made that a couple of those lobes and uh, would have put it in some sacks and that's what you'd have had all day in a in a what you would have called a purse back then um, that's it and they would have hoped to have a meal before they went to bed that is most of humanity for 6,000 years and so when he says don't be without covetousness we've gone way beyond this way beyond this. 
No, we're looking for the next new thing or the next new gadget. Uh, you know, the you know you, you can't go you can't go three years without a new car. I had a great uncle, loved him to death. You've heard a lot about him, but that man was car poor. I only want to know what the notes were on his vehicle because he had to be upside down for years and years and years. Why? Because he just could not keep the same car for more than about three years. We just buy a new one. You know, it's, it's, it's people who, they're not satisfied with the house they're in, even though it's, it's, it's literally a palatial mansion compared to most of the world today. Um, you know, you're sitting in a three-bedroom, two-bath, cookie-cutter, you know, basic starter home, you know? You're living, you're living, the rest of the world looks at you as, a, as somebody who's living in a mansion. But we just want something new. I'm not against building better, but when it comes to covetousness, what happens is, is when, we, when we're constantly searching those things uh, and we're trying to provide uh, for years on down the road, which is not bad. It's, it's a biblical principle. You understand? It's a biblical principle to lay in store for hard times. That is a biblical principle. But when you begin to be covetousness, what you're doing is your, your love and your desires and your, um, it, it becomes such a priority to you that it is over and above God. Covetousness puts those material things above God. You say, how does that flesh out in our normal life? Working overtime instead of coming to church? Y'all yeah. following me? Um, how does that flesh out? Oh, taking a promotion that will keep you out of church. Do you, do you, are you tracking? I'm just talking about some generalized things. How does that flesh out? That can flesh out in our life where it becomes the priority is making money and providing and laying up and the priority is not God. And, and when he writes this, he says, here's the reason, because if you start putting your priority on the material world, you're going to lose sight of things. And then when bad things begin to happen and the screws begin to tighten, because they'll always tighten, you always you ever notice that people will make more and more money and they'll still say they're broke? Um, I don't, I, whatever. We we keep going. Uh, I, he says, listen, if you if you seek if you seek the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto you. This is not a this is a biblical principle that we see carried out. And he said, you will not fear what man shall do unto me. So you remember, let's go back to our example and then we'll move on from this text. Okay? If we stop being so materialistic. And we are, trust me, from the pulpit back to the back of the room, you say, I'm not materialistic. You're more materialistic than, than anybody in the New Testament, guaranteed, because you grew up American. Uh, it's just, in, it's ingrained in us, you know. Uh, back to our example, okay, we got the three brothers here. It's convenient, y'all are all about the same age. <laughs> um, they've got hair, yeah. Maybe that's why you're so mad and you're having that funeral for Marshall. Yeah, sorry. I saw a picture of Sig when he was younger. Oh, man. man, he looked like he had a chia pet on top of his head. I don't know what happened. Elvis was jealous, Elvis was jealous you say? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I need some young guys who won't distract me to sit up here. Zach, where are you when I need you? Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't do this to me. Only these guys. Um, when they held that funeral for him, you understand that it, like the anxiety level of this man and his wife and his children just went through the roof because he has to figure out how he's going to feed himself and his family and provide for himself. And God says, stop loving all that and stop worrying about. I mean, He's not saying sit on your in your easy chair and let manna fall down from the sky. That's not what He's saying. He says, stop being anxious about it. And just trust me. Because if you don't trust God, these men, the fear of these men, their brothers, the brothers, and the fear of the government, and the fear of the employer, and the fear of the grocery man who won't sell you groceries, will cripple you, and you will compromise, and you will serve them, and not the king of kings. You see, covetousness will literally turn you from serving God for many reasons, but particularly in this. And by the way, you and I, 
If we're not careful, we're a generation away from this. It may even be in our generation. Because look at our neighbors to the north, and I've said this more than once, our neighbors across the ocean, you know, the, these places, and they're putting pastors in jail. If once they put pastors in jail, guess who they're coming for next? They'll come for you next. And you will make a decision. Feed my family or serve God. Because of fear. Many will choose to feed their family. And God says, don't be that way. Because if you do, you'll give in to your fear. Serve me, I'll take care of you. Who you who you more uh, who who do you who do you trust more, <laughs> society or God? That's what it boils down to. Covetousness is about that. Who do you trust more, society or God? I'll I'll put it to you this way, and we'll move on. Do mm, we'll never make it through the end of this? This by this this la this is how Proverbs is going to go because this last section of Hebrews is kind of like Proverbs. It's like here's a principle, here's a principle, here's a principle. Who do you trust more now? Let me, uh, let me tell you, how many of you 20 years ago, um, if you were alive, would have thought preppers are crazy? Be honest, preppers are crazy. That's nuts. How many of you thought that was crazy? All right, yeah. How many of you have changed your mind on preppers and their tinfoil hats? No, listen, none of, you can't do that. Some of y'all are not voting. How many of you have changed your mind? They're not that crazy. Yeah, why? Oh, uh, okay. Preppers. You know, the people who put the food back for like 100 years, you know, and, uh, and they build their underground bunkers and all that junk. You know those people? Yeah, preppers. Preppers. People who are prep. Yeah. Y'all don't know who preppers are? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Some of the people in this room aren't going to be able to vote because they don't even know what I'm talking about. They're like, ooh, what? What's going on? Okay. Prepared. Prepared. Yes. They're, they're called preppers. Preppers. Okay. I guess I should define the term first. And <laughs> coming out of the great, how many of you had uh, parents or grandparents that were in the Great Depression that lived through that? Okay. Didn't you think they were crazy? Like, why are we canning for 20 years? Just go to the grocery store. Doesn't that sound crazy? Did it seem crazy in the, uh, how many of you were, uh, were uh, you know, 20? Uh, uh, yeah, it tasted good. Okay. I need some 40 and 50 year olds. 40 and 50 year olds. Matt, didn't that seem crazy? Why are we canning for a hundred years? Yeah. The grocery store has food. Yeah. Y'all with me? This sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. I know, but that's the generation you came out of. You don't you don't trust the government because they've not been here before. Y'all with me? There's a generation that's come up, most of us, quite frankly, that don't have silver hair quite yet. I mean, the grocery stores have always had food in them until recently. Everything's kind of just been okay until recently. My point is this, is that when you, have a tr when you have faith in something, you don't have to store and you don't have to worry about it. The system's going to function just fine. It'll be okay. That was kind of people's attitude, very laissez-faire about food and health care and energy and water. Y'all with me? But we saw how that the how that our society, and I'm not even talking about our government, just our society, is a lot more fragile than we might think it is. But I can assure you. So if you put your trust in all that, even putting up food restores and putting, I mean, I'm 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 tracking here with the intent of Hebrews, okay? Even if you trust in all that, if your trust is there, you're still trusting in a faulty. Situ a, a faulty um, ideology. ideology, yeah, because it'll run out. It can be taken from you in an instant. Because, quite frankly, listen, I, I store stuff because, well, I mean, it's good to store stuff, and I, I we freeze dry food at my house. And why do we freeze dry food at my house? Well, because we use it camping and hiking, but it also sits in the shelf for 30 years, maybe more. I don't know. The, the, we don't really know how long it lasts. It lasts a long time in a mylar bag. And so, like, hey, listen, I may lose my job. At least I'll have food. You know? I, it's not like I'm prepared to, but it could be taken from me in a heartbeat. You say, well, not you. You're, you're that guy that will keep his stuff. I'm like, yeah, but you know how long, you know how many dudes it takes to pull security 24 hours a day, seven days a week? I got nothing but girls at my house. I cannot stay awake for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and if 12, 
if 12 people David's age show up and say, listen, I want your food, there's nothing I can do about it. I cannot trust in that. I can do some... I can, I can make sure that those 12 dudes have a lot, some of them will have a lot more food because there'll be less of them, but they will eventually win. You all understanding? You cannot trust in that stuff. It doesn't matter. Go put your stuff in a safety deposit box. Whatever. You can't trust in that. But there is a source that you can trust in. It will never fail. It has never failed. It will never fail in all of time. From beginning to end, you can put your trust in God. And when your fear is misplaced, your fear should be in the Lord, not men or situations. When your fear is misplaced, that's when you become covetousness. When your fear is misplaced, when you don't fear the right thing, if you get anything out of Sunday school this morning, when your fear is mismanaged, when you are not fearing what you should, you'll become covetous. Among other things. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. And you'll act foolish when you don't fear the Lord. I.e., you'll, chase, you'll put your dependence on everything else. You'll go full-blown dependent on something else. And it may not be prepping. You may decide you're going to uh, put all of your eggs in the retirement basket. You with me? So that you can not worry about the future. You may put all your eggs in another basket. I don't care. Or you may diversify your eggs. But they're still not in God's basket. The only basket that you can put all your eggs in and they'll be fine is God's. When we trust those other things is when we get in trouble. So the writer of Hebrews is writing to Jewish people who are literally suffering. I mean, that's the kind of suffering. This is like world collapse, Armageddon stuff, even though... Even though society is still functioning, for them, it might as well have been broken because they decided they'd serve God. And if they were going to be covetous, they would have to turn their back on God. And God says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I don't have time to move into the next thing. I got through one tiny... (laughs) I literally got through a sentence on my notes. Two. Two sentences. Y'all impressed, aren't you? Yeah. Um, we'll move into the next part here. I think the next two things will go together. Um, and quite frankly, I don't want to teach them anyway. It's because it's verse number seven. Remember them have rule over you, which is me. And then uh, it's a difficult passage when you're the guy. Um, and then it talks about um, it talks about doctrines and moving away from doctrines. And then it talks about uh, obey them that have rule over you again in verse number 17. And these things are kind of sandwiched together. We'll try to take care of that. Uh, next week, and uh, so if you don't want to hear about listen to your pastor, then don't come to Sunday school next week. That's what I'll tell you. And uh, but just know that if you don't come to Sunday school, that you're causing me grief. Verse number seventeen: uh, that you they has they must give account, which means that they're literally trying to help you, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it is unprofitable for you. So um, this is kind of interesting. I think it'll be a help to you. And uh, it also helps you find a good, if you have to move, you find a good church home if you can understand what a good pastor looks like. And uh, I think that'll help to you. And then any thoughts, questions, concerns? Have you ever thought, do you, this is a regular exercise. How many of you, this is a regular exercise, when you read the scripture, you go, um, who am I in this, in, in this passage? You know, where would I fit in? Because a lot of times we make an erroneous idea because we kind of live in the lower, many of us are kind of middle class, lower middle class. I'm not trying to be insultive. That's where we're at, okay? Anybody a millionaire? <laughs> That'd be great. I need to build a building soon. <clears throat> All right, okay. Um, we, you know, we think of ourselves as these people in the lower middle class when absolutely not. <laughs> we are those who fare sumptuously in Scripture. You know, we're absolutely not. Uh, it, not even close. And so we are literally high society to anybody in Scripture. How many of you have ever thought that? Listen, you can be on government assistance in this country, and you are literally high class in the Bible. I mean, you're the guy wearing purple, faring sumptuously, you know, and the guy in James has gay clothing, you know, that doesn't mean what you think it means because they've changed the meaning of every word. It means just, just a, a, you know, 
the rich guy, you're the rich guy walking into the church in the book of James. It's hard for us to think that way because we all think we're broke, right? Yeah, we're not. We're rich people. By, by the way, we're rich people by modern standards, if you look globally. And we're rich people even beyond that by biblical standards. And so think about that as you read your Bible. Um, understand what it means to me if I was to put myself in these people's shoes. And so, Any thoughts, questions, concerns, snide remarks? This is the time for them. For the sake. Yes. We have a friend who's a missionary, and uh, he hasn't been able to get into the country, but he teaches life classes mm-hmm. online. And uh, he has a friend that has been saved, and it's good testimony, and I think he had not even come to the country. His family divorced him, white kids, and so I mean, it's still. There are many, there are many places in the world where this is still a very common thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to our analogy: uh, when he when he does die, he'll die alone. No, seriously, um, he'll die alone. Why? Because his family abandoned him. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, by the way, and we're going to be in the Book of Job tonight, talking about. Um, keeping your integrity and what that really means what that really means a lot of us want to have integrity right what is that really going to cost you curse God and die what is that really going to cost you and so I've never I've preached out of Job 1 through 2 three or four times I've never preached out of this particular verse as the main idea and I think it's going to be helpful to you I've mentioned some thoughts from it but I think it's going to be helpful tonight I don't have anything else. Anybody got anything else? I thought I saw a hand. Maybe not. Miss Marta, that was you. Yes. Uh, well, Marshall was, but sure. Yeah. Would he be able to go to his own funeral? Go to his own funeral? I don't know. Probably not, but I don't know why you would, but yeah, I don't, I don't really don't know. I mean, there's not a lot of narrative on that in, in history, but. Um, you could have probably got lost in the crowd and watched your own funeral, but it wouldn't have been a pleasant one. They wouldn't have had nice things to say about you, unless it was what you used to be before you came to Christ, which would have reviled. I mean, it would have repulsed you. Like who? If you really have come to Christ, then you thought who you used to be was an evil person. Why would you want anybody to say anything good about that? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You you wouldn't. You'd have been a stranger, if 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 Marshall would have showed up to his own funeral that these two brothers of his uh, hosted, and we would have all been there because we're part of the city, right? And we don't know any better. Um, and and you know, Christians were minority in Jewish cultures. They were minority in Jewish uh, Jewish cult- Jewish Christians were even when there were thousands of them getting saved. They're still a minority. Three thousand people in a city of a million is not that many people. Um, and so you know. There were several thousand of them getting saved. I'd say 10, 15, 20 in the first uh, several months in, in Jerusalem, but they weren't all from Jerusalem. Remember, this was, these were feast days, right? So they had a lot of influx out-of-town folks, and they were going back to their homes. And there might be a family or two in their village or the place they were going to that was, um, there were Christians. They were going back to a place that was going to disown them for being publicly Christians. And, and it was going to be a bad deal. And that's why God writes these things to us. Uh, and by the way, that very same that very same thing can very quickly happen overnight in our culture, and uh, just you, we need to be prepared for it and have our hearts and minds right, because the day could come. I have, I hope it doesn't. But here, here, by the way, here's the thing: is I have to finish. If we serve God like this now, when it doesn't cost us anything to do it, we'll n- probably, likely, never move into a society where it will cost us. Because we'll have, we have the freedom to, sh- to evangelize today and to live for Christ today, albeit a little more diminished than it was a, ge- a generation ago. But if we'll do it, our children and grandchildren will still have what we have, if not better. So put God first today. That's this morning's message anyway, so I might as well move right into it.
Uh, let's pray and ask God to do something wonderful. We'll look at this uh, last little